That's Jeff's backyard office. And in this video, I'm going to tell you the story of how it came to be, starting with the design. So first, let me show you what his backyard looked like before we built anything. It was shaped kind of like a rectangle with the back edge being on an angle and consisted of a shed, a patio area, and some bushes. The patio area was accessed either from a door through the garage or through sliding doors from the house. Pretty quickly, it became clear that we had to have the backyard office on the right side of the property and thus move the shed. If we had it on the left, it would sit too far forward in the backyard and encroach on his patio. So we removed a few bushes, moved the shed to the left, and therefore freed up some space for this backyard office. It is here that we can start to see the backyard being divided into two separate zones. On the left, we have the garage door entry and the shed, both of which are used for storage and not much of an interactive space for the backyard. Then on the right, we have the sliding door, which you enter from the living room. We have the backyard office, as well as the table and the barbecue that sit on the patio. So now we can start to see that the right zone is a space that is gonna be occupied a lot more often than the left. You can be going from your office to inside, to the table at the patio, to the barbecue. There's a lot of circulation that can go along here. And also there's the potential to have guests. When we're in the right zone of the backyard, we don't really wanna be looking at that plastic shed. We wanna block off the views from the office to the shed, and we wanna avoid any interaction between the two. It's here that we can start to see that the left and the back side of the office are very closed off. There are no interaction, there's no windows. And so it's kind of like this wing wrapping over the shed, covering it from those angles. To continue this idea of a wing wrapping over the office from the sides where we don't want any interaction, we decided to use a black corrugated metal material for both those left and back faces, as well as the roof. On the front and the right sides, we went with a more inviting material. We chose a wood-like material that we painted white because those are the ones that's facing that right zone. With the design done, it was time to figure out how I was going to build this off-site and then transport it to his backyard. The trouble is, the only access to this backyard was through this door, which is a standard 80 inches tall by I think 30 inches wide. So all the modules have to fit through this space. This is our constraint for how we design the modules. My solution was to divide three walls into six modules with the front wall being built on site. Most modules were four by eight feet. However, one on the back wall was about six feet wide, still being able to fit through the door. I started by framing each module to within a 16th of an inch. After that, I nailed on the OSB sheathing, making sure that I left a small gap on the outer edges to allow for the expansion and contraction of the OSB when up against the following module. Next, I installed the Tyvek house wrap, which acted as both the air and water barrier. I made sure to lap it over the bottom edge of the OSB since that was close to the ground and I didn't want that to get damaged. I also made sure to leave a small overhang on either side so that it could be overlapped with the next module. Following this, I installed the exterior insulation as well as the strapping that the siding would be nailed to. I made sure to leave the outer insulation pieces on a hinge so that when I'm joining modules, I could overlap and tape the Tyvek barriers. You'll see more of this later. Additionally, I left some Tyvek loose at the top so that I could tape it to the roof's water barrier. I repeated all of these steps for every module. But before we were ready for moving day, some work on site needed to be done. We did some landscaping and we moved the shed to the other side of the yard. Whoa, you hear what I said? I'm gonna include this audio. It's more <laughs> That was actually done before the winter. Winter came and as I was building the modules, I knew that I would only be able to install them once my foundation was complete. However, the ground was frozen. So in order to build this foundation, I needed the ground to unfreeze as soon as possible. Now, I couldn't wait on the weather for that, so I tried to speed it up myself by insulating the ground from the cold air above, hoping that the Earth's heat would slowly thaw out that ground. Unfortunately, this didn't work. I think my problem was that there was still too much airflow under that insulation, so it never sufficiently insulated the ground. I think if I were to try this again, I would use a different form of insulation, one that can conform to the ground a lot better than rigid foam, something like bad insulation. 
Regardless, the foundation had to be built. And once the snow was cleared, even if the ground wasn't really thawed, I got to work. I built the entirety of the floor frame offsite so I could just drop everything into place. For the foundation, I decided to use earth screws. The installation process for this is fairly simple. Hammer and rebar into the ground, make sure it's going down straight, and then use that rebar as a way to guide the earth screw once you finally screw it in. It sounds easy, and in ideal conditions, it is. Except, yeah, the ground wasn't really fully thawed at this stage, so it was a little bit more work than I initially expected. So with one earth screw down and three more to go, I thought, let's try and make this process a little bit more efficient. So I bought an auger with the goal of using it as kind of like a screwdriver to get those earth screws down in the ground. I figured, well, I'm gonna be building a lot more of these foundations, so the time saved, eventually this auger will pay itself off. Regardless, it was an expensive bet that this would work. Moment of truth. And it didn't. Well, kinda. Basically, the motor would encounter too much resistance, and although I wanted the instant torque of an electric motor, the problem was I went with something that was battery powered. And thus, when there's too much resistance, it would cut power to the motor to not have the battery explode. So it was back to the normal way. <laughs> the auger still did work for some holes, but it would only go in spurts until it was too much for the motor. I'll still be using the auger for concrete piers, so I'm not too worried. That being said, it was a very hard trial run for the auger. It was essentially going through frozen clay. Another thing that had to be done before we brought in the modules was to dig the trench so that we could connect the electrical system of the backyard office to the main house. It was here that I realized the ground was indeed frozen the whole time. Wow. <laughs> But soon enough, the trench was dug, the insulation and the joists were dropped into place. We were now ready for moving day. Today's a big day because the on-site progress, everything that you see on-site is about to go from like 15% to 70% in a day. It's been a lot of planning that has went into this day. A lot of building too. I'm hoping that everything goes smoothly because, I mean, I built everything to my drawings and I know my drawings are correct. I just hope I didn't screw up my build. So we're just getting the subfloor in now and I made a mistake. Earlier when I built my workshop, when I built my work table in my workshop, I- You told me to keep working. No, I know, you're right, I did. So we're just getting the subfloor in right now and earlier I made a mistake. When I built my work table for my workshop, I ended up using one of the plywood pieces that I was gonna use for the subfloor. So, as you can see, we have the work table in the background. I'm gonna have to part with that, cut it in half. So when I 
constructing, you want to make sure that your air, water, and thermal barriers are all good and that there's proper overlap between them. So the problem with modular construction is every single time you join two pieces together, there's a potential break in all three of those barriers. So as you can see here, this is where they join. This is my air and water barrier. They overlap, insulation barrier on top. Doors in and it's weather tight for tomorrow's rainstorm. <laughs> yes. So the way that I'm insulating this house is a little bit different. Um, I'm actually stealing this from this guy named Matt Rezinger. I'll link his YouTube channel in the description. He's a builder down in Texas. And he has this really cool idea called a Monopoly house. The Monopoly houses, they don't have overhangs. So the way that I'm insulating this with my insulation layer and my water barrier is just what needs to be insulated. This backyard office is going to have overhangs, but there's no point in insulating overhangs if you can't live in them. After it's all insulated and fully sealed, then I screw on my overhangs. Okay, back to work. There's actually a B plot to this story. This whole time that this was being built, I was also developing with my team my website. You can now head on over to friesdesign.com and begin designing your own backyard office. That is if you're in Toronto. If you're in the States or Manitoba or something like that, I'm sorry, but I can't build that for you right now. Maybe in the future, but right now I'm only building in Toronto. So. Head on over to friesdesign.com, begin the quiz, and we can work together. Maybe, maybe you can get this, or something like this. No, it won't be this. It'll be custom for you, because that's what I do. Okay, here's the montage.